Our whole business used to be right in here. I can't believe it. It feels so small. Even though it's empty, it feels so small after getting used to that warehouse. We used to fit all of our woodworking tools in this tiny two-car garage. It's a small two-car garage. It stresses me out to even think about all the stuff we had to do when we were working in here. Not only is it a tight space, but it also stresses me out to remember how difficult it was to live and work in the same exact space. So we've been in our new space for a few months now and it completely changed our lifestyle and the way we do business. No longer are we on top of each other trying to get things done. We have space, beautiful space. I mean, we're still in close proximity to each other. And we still get each other's way sometimes, but at least now we have space to retreat if we want to. And we need those spaces to retreat because working with other people is hard. It's difficult to work with anyone, let alone your spouse. And figuring out a work-life balance can be hard, but we think we've figured out a few really good tips and tricks to do it successfully. We've started four businesses together and only one of them has really failed. That was a web design business where I was not focused on helping the customer. I just wanted to build really cool websites and I did not listen to what the customer wanted. And it was a very painful lesson to learn for me. I tried to get Jenny to jump in and help save the business. Didn't really happen. I was asking way too much of Jenny to come in and fix all of my problems. So I ultimately ended up killing that business. Then we started a custom furniture business or a custom furniture business just sort of fell into our laps after our friends really wanted to buy stuff. At the same time, we started this media business of all of our social media channels. And then we decided we didn't want to do custom furniture forever, so we restarted the furniture business once we moved down here to Houston, and we don't do as much custom stuff anymore. So believe me when I say we've seen a lot about working from home, managing a full-time job with a part-time side hustle, managing a full-time side hustle with a full-time job. We've seen just about every combination of entrepreneurship that there is to have when it comes to working from home. So how did we do all that without killing each other? <laughs> well, we tried anyways. Well, there's a lot of things that we've done to try and balance work and life together. And we also asked you guys what you wanted to know about us balancing our work and life. And we compiled all of our tips and tricks and answers and all of your questions into basically four different categories. So we're just gonna go right through them. We stopped letting him win a long time ago. This house taught us a lot of lessons about running a business and managing work-life balance and all sorts of things. And that's the first category of questions we wanna answer is all the big lessons that we learned from starting and running businesses together. The first thing we wanna talk about and the number one thing that y'all wanted to talk about was how to set boundaries between your work life and your personal life, especially when you run your own business or you work from home. And I would say that that's the biggest lesson first off is to set boundaries between your work life and your personal life. And that's much easier said than done. Setting boundaries is no small task. It's a very big conversation, but I think you need to have it with yourself and your family and everyone else that's involved with you running a business. I mean, we had the boundaries discussion half a dozen times when we first started our businesses. I mean, when we first had the boundary discussion, we were still full-time in the Air Force, so there really wasn't a lot of extra time to devote to the business, but we knew we wanted to do it anyway, so we had to sacrifice a lot of our personal time in order to start the business. And in those early stages, what sacrifices you're willing to make and where you draw the line for your boundaries is so critically important, and you and your whole family need to be on the same page where that's concerned. But the problem was we didn't have those boundary discussions enough. It got to a certain point where I was burned out and overwhelmed from running the business and I didn't have any more free time I could tap into to recharge, recoup, or just deal with the burnout that I was in. Not to mention that the military lifestyle doesn't leave you a whole lot of free time anyway. So I was really tapped out after the first couple of years of running our custom furniture business. I didn't even realize that I was approaching burnout either. That's sort of the hard part is you can't see yourself when you're in a bad situation. 
It's easy to see other people in bad situations, but it's really hard to see it when something is bad about your own schedule and your own routine. Which brings us to the second big lesson in work-life balance, which is spend time with other people doing what you're doing. We've all heard the cheesy quote, you're the average of the five people you spend the most time with. And it's absolutely true. When we first started our business, we had a lot of military friends. And there's nothing wrong with that. We love our military friends. But there's a lot of confusion and oftentimes misunderstanding when you're trying to start a business within military culture. I'm sure it's similar in corporate culture as well. But people were just very confused. It was very hard for them to understand exactly what and why we were doing what we were doing. They thought it was cute. They didn't always take it seriously. They thought it was just a fun little hobby we would do whenever we weren't at work. And for a while, it was. It was a fun hobby. But then there were also people who kind of understood what we were doing and hired us to build furniture and do other jobs for them. And we're super appreciative of those people. But at the end of the week, we were left questioning what we were doing and if we were going the right direction just because nobody else around us was doing what we were doing and everybody else was questioning it too. Then we made our first set of friends who were also running a business in town. And that's when the whole game changed. No longer were we confused about what we were doing or if we were on the right path because talking to them, we were able to discuss some of the same problems we were having, some of the wins we would have, and just any other confusion that came along with running a business while also having a full-time job. We didn't feel so crazy anymore for doing something that was so radically different than what everybody around us was doing. But people who start a business are busy people and rightly so. There is so much to do when you run a business. So that makes making friends hard. You have to really be intentional about getting on each other's schedules. And time spent searching for friends was time not spent on the business. So we really wish there would have been an easier way to find friends running a business rather than just blindly searching for them and, and hoping we magically found somebody in our community. And that's exactly why we created the stud stack. And this is not a sales pitch. We started the stud stack because we wish there would have been a community of other people doing what we were doing when we first started our business. We would have had much more confidence in, in our ability to run a business and the fact that we weren't crazy. There are other people out there like us and like you. Now here's the sales pitch. If you want a community of friends that are doing exactly what you're doing without having to search for forever to find them, use the link below the like button in the description to sign up for the stud stack. There is a lot packed into a stud stack membership, but the community is the biggest part. All right, so the second category, what's been the hardest part of working together with your spouse? We got that question a lot and um, man, I wish I had a good answer. It's just so easy when it's with you. Good answer. <laughs> I would say the hardest part about working with your spouse or working with anybody as a partner is you don't really know who they fully are until they're under an immense amount of pressure. We've learned things about ourselves and about each other that we didn't even know about ourselves. Once we started running a business. I mean, obviously we knew each other before we started this, we got married but your true colors come out when you're stressed and you're trying to tackle a really big project together. Yeah, and you're learning new things and you're trying tasks that you've never had to even consider before and it's all big and scary. And to be honest, it can be sort of a mess sometimes. You really wanna identify your strengths and weaknesses as an individual person and then sort of see where there's overlap um, in your business partner. You kinda you wanna think about how you can save each other. Where one person is weak, where can the other person be really strong and where can you assign roles and responsibilities within the business to take advantage of those strengths and weaknesses. But just because you have a partner to help you doesn't mean both of you can catch everything. Let me give you an example. Jenny and I are both terrible at details. <laughs> We're constantly forgetting things. We don't put things on the calendar. We don't make lists. I can't tell you how many times we've totally forgotten that we committed to an event at church or some sort of volunteer event or something and we just forgot to put it in the calendar because we're not detail oriented and we both miss it. Happens all the time. So just because you have a partner doesn't mean you can depend on them 
to solve all of your own problems because they might have the same weakness in the same area. So you've really got to take inventory of what you're good at and what you're bad at. And, and take responsibility of what you're bad at because somebody's got to step up and be good at the details. I know we're both bad at it, but somebody's got to do it. And you've got to be prepared for those conversations and you've got to be prepared to see a different side of your partner or your spouse that you never saw before. You're going to see a completely different side of your spouse than you expected to see. For example, when we first started doing deliveries on our custom furniture pieces in our first furniture business back in North Dakota, I was shocked that Davis didn't have like full confidence upon delivery because he's naturally a pretty self-confident person. But when we did the delivery, he was always so worried that the customer was going to hate it. He could only see the flaws in his work. So he would get really squirrely and kind of nervous at the delivery. And so that's where I had to step in and be the bubbly person that was exuding confidence about the piece and saying good things about it and dealing with the homeowners and, and kind of having the little like personality part of the delivery, which is hard for me because I don't naturally have a super talkative, big, bubbly personality either. So we both kind of had to work through our strengths to come through for successful deliveries. And it was really awesome to see Jenny come out of her shell on those deliveries. And she acted bubbly and happy and just super extroverted, which is not generally how she acts all the time. So just get prepared to see your spouse or your partner in a completely different light because different situations are going to bring different things out of them and it's really cool to watch um, and when they do a really good job with it you want to make sure that you're rewarding that and encouraging it yeah um, and not just let those moments slip by on that note another really hard lesson we had to learn was that one person is always going to want the business a little more than the other person the business is always usually out of the passion of one of the two partners. And so naturally, the person whose passion or hobby it is to run the business is usually who's going to want it more. Very rarely do a husband and wife team both want it the same amount. And that's not wrong. It's just you've got to acknowledge that and you've got to know who wants it more. When we were doing custom furniture, I wanted the business a lot more than Jenny does. Now that we do batched and production style furniture and stuff, Jenny is all about this business. And I'm just like, man, I'll, yeah, I'll make some cutting boards. So just outlining that and, and setting the expectations appropriately has been really huge. Um, and understanding that that's normal. It's okay. Just don't expect your spouse to fill that hole in your heart because they don't want it as bad as you want it. Mm -hmm. That's a recipe for disaster. I remember with the silly web design business, I wanted Jenny to come in and bail me out. And so um, I would have her cold call small businesses that I thought needed my glorious websites uh, downtown. And Jenny was just not having it. She didn't have any sales skills. She didn't want to do it. She didn't. It just did not sound fun to me at all. <laughs> and it wasn't fun, especially not with me asking you to do it, not very politely. And so it just, it got to be a really bad situation. And fortunately we were able to step back and just shut that business down. Um, but yeah, like I was expecting Jenny to care about it as much as I cared about it. And when she didn't, I got angry at her and that was just not fair. So just know that one of you is always gonna want the business way more than the other one. And cut the other person some slack, okay? It's just because they're supporting you doesn't mean they need to be as excited about it as you are. And it's a good thing to be different than your spouse. You both shouldn't want the exact same things. That'd be kind of weird if all the time you wanted the exact same thing. If you were both the same, you wouldn't be able to cover each other's blind spots and see the things that the other person misses. For example, Davis is really good at conflict resolution in dealing with any customers that might be confused or unhappy or angry. There was this one time we were sending out a whole bunch of boards for a realtor for all of her Christmas gifts for her clients. And there was some miscommunication with her and her secretary and a whole bunch of emails sent back and forth. Anyways, the realtor thought that we had sent out her gifts late or they weren't going to get there on time because of something her secretary had said. So she texted me kind of upset and angry, wanting to go back and forth on the he said, she said, and I was really overwhelmed. I didn't know what she wanted. She had just sent me a list of a bunch of questions and wanted to know what her secretary said and I said and what email said. And I was just super confused and overwhelmed. But Davis was able to read that and identify that really all she cared about was whether or not her boards were gonna get sent out on time. And so that's what I replied back with, hey, we just sent them and they're all gonna get there on time. And sure enough, 
she was happy. I wanted to sit there and answer every single one of her questions in that text message, whereas Davis realized she was really only asking one question. So you wanna actually encourage the differences between each other because you never know when that person's different perspective is actually gonna help you in the long run. Wanna hear some really trashy advice? Fight with your spouse. If you work together and you disagree about something, have the fight. Don't get passive aggressive. If you want something, you need to make that known. You need to be 100% transparent and open with your partner. Because harboring resentment is a guaranteed way to make your problem reappear later. And it's gonna be much nastier than just having the fight right now. Practice communication, practice disagreeing with somebody and still being respectful at the same time because that's gonna be an invaluable skill when it comes to working with your spouse, or anybody for that matter. We had a big fight about charcuterie boards in our new furniture business. I did not want to make charcuterie boards, and Jenny wanted me to. They were gonna be complicated and hard to build and difficult to get a procedure for, and I frankly just didn't wanna do it. And I wanted them done because I knew charcuterie was hot and these things would sell. To this day, I have certain clients that only buy charcuterie boards, and I just knew that's what the market wanted, so I was really fighting to have Davis include charcuterie boards in our product line. But had either one of us just pulled rank and put our foot down, it would have ended very poorly because mm -hmm the other person would have been upset. And three to six months from now, all that anger is gonna get unleashed in a different situation where you might not be able to avoid the fight. And all of that pressure from the last three or four failed fights finally comes out and it's not pretty when it does. So as uncomfortable as it is up front, even if you're the kind of person that doesn't like conflict, learn to get good at disagreeing and fighting with your partner in a healthy, productive way. Not that you just let the fights go on for days and days and days, but to where you both come to a conclusion that you can both agree on and be happy about. Communication is the nicer way to say that. <laughs> but our version is to fight with your spouse until you both reach a conclusion you're either both happy about or you're both upset about. Because what's really bad is when you have hidden information or somebody's not bringing all the details into light to try to help their case or hurt your case, just be honest, get it all out there and just get the fight over with so that you can figure out where you're gonna go from there. Hi, uh, editing this video, it's getting a little long. So we're gonna split into two parts. Subscribe so you can see the second part. I hope you've really enjoyed the stories. We've had a ton of fun telling them all over again. In the next video, we're gonna talk about setting good goals for your business, which is crucially important. And then we're also gonna talk about actual practical strategies for work-life balance, okay? So you don't wanna miss it. Hit subscribe and we'll see you on the next one. Ask me how I do it, I just stick to the plan.